Dr. Jennifer St. John's will be speaking on adrenal disorders. Dr. St. John's is an endocrinologist at Baylor Scott White in McKinney, Texas. Dr. St. John's completed her medical degree at Lake Erie College of Osteopathic Medicine and is board certified in endocrinology. All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the adrenal gland. There's definitely a lot of things involved in this gland, so I'm trying to hit kind of the big topics. Um, so I have no disclosures in regard to this presentation. So what we're going to do is describe a little bit about the anatomy and physiology of the glands, outline the action of some of the hormones of the gland, uh, describe the assessment of the patients with adrenal disorders, including looking at some of the diagnostic tools, um, analyze the clinical presentation of the most common disorders, uh, looking at diagnosis and treatment, and then if there are any psychosocial lifestyle considerations, we'll also um, delve into that a little bit. So when we look at the gland itself, there you have two of them. Uh, they're on each side and sit right on top of the kidney, um, composed of multi-layers. Multi the outermost, the cortex, has uh, three distinct layers of hormonal production. And then the innermost layer, the medulla, which is responsible for a lot of your stress hormones. In general, the gland is going to be responsible for regulating some of the body's adapted response to stress, uh, helping maintain body water, as well as sodium and potassium balance. There is, a, of course, with that control of blood pressure, and then there's a minor role in sex hormone production there. So when we look at the various layers in the cortex, um, the outermost layer, the zona glomerulosa, is going to be responsible primarily for your aldosterone production. Um, moving to the more internal layer, uh, the, the fasciculata, where your glucocorticoids are formed, and the primary um, hormone there is your cortisol. If we move to the innermost layer, the reticularis, this is where your androgens are formed. And actually the primary hormones uh, there is a DHEAS. Um, so DHEA and DHEAS are actually the primary uh, androgens produced. There's very little synthesis of testosterone in a normal adrenal gland. All right, so um, we're gonna start with a little bit of the hyperfunctional states. So first off, primary hypoaldosterone, again, looking at that outermost layer of the cortex. This is basically a syndrome of inappropriate, relatively non-suppressible renin-independent aldosterone production. So at this point, uh, the prevalence is estimated to be somewhere around 15 to 25%. And interestingly enough, in 1960s, when Dr. Kahn was first studying this, the thought was that there was only less than 1% of the population um, affected by this. So this should be high on everyone's radar and someone who has high blood pressure. Um, so clinically, these patients are gonna have hypertension. Um, it could be very mild and intermittent or very persistent and severe and they may or may not have hypokalemia. So we should definitely suspect it in someone who has severe or resistant hypertension. Um, and I would say in anyone with any unprovoked hypokalemia, even if they have normal blood pressure, it's probably good to screen them. Um, definitely if they have hypertension with an adrenal mass or hypertension with sleep apnea. Um, and then of course, if there's a family has history suggestive of that, that is also a great person to screen. So when we start, we look at what lab testing do we do for case detection? And generally, you're going to start with a plasma renin and an aldosterone level. What we're looking for is a very low renin. Now, it doesn't matter if you get a plasma renin activity or a plasma renin concentration, though I will say most labs are moving now towards the plasma renin concentration. But you're basically looking for a low level there. And then you want an aldosterone of about 10 to 15. Um, basically, we're looking at that separation and threshold between those values, and then you can also calculate a ratio. Now, it varies from guideline to guideline what the cutoff for the aldosterone to renin ratio should be, but generally a 20 to 30 um, ratio is, is, is pretty, pretty significant. Um, and interestingly enough, we're finding more and more with aldosterone and, and defining it that even lower levels may be more suspicious. So down the road, we may actually see cutoffs that are somewhere of a, a total aldosterone of eight, possibly becoming concerning for this condition. Now, when you do your testing, most of your antihypertensives can be continued. And most people go, well, what about spironolactone? 
Well, one of the things with spironolactone is, is that uh, if your renin is still suppressed on it, that means you haven't fully blocked your mineral corticoid receptor. So you can still get a very accurate ratio if that is. Now, if you find the renin is elevated on the spironolactone, then withdrawing the agent uh, would be appropriate and retesting off of it. And then once you have a positive case detection, we want to move on to confirmatory testing. Now, when you confirm, there are a number of tests out there. Probably the most commonly used are going to be these two. The first is in a saline infusion, where you're basically going to give about two liters of normal saline over four hours. And you're going to look and see if the aldosterone still remains greater than 10, then that is significant and kind of confirms the diagnosis. The other thing that we often proceed with is an oral sodium load. And so basically you want to have your patient consume at least five grams of sodium for three days. And then you pull a 24 hour urine collection. You're looking for an aldosterone that's, that's at least 12. And with that, you often want to get a urine sodium and make sure that that is greater than 200 to make sure they properly loaded. Now, if the patient thinks that they can't get that much sodium in, you could always um, prescribe uh, sodium tablets. Um, but in the American diet, it's pretty easy to get it. If you go to McDonald's and get a Big Mac, there's a, a whole gram of sodium there. Add a number of 400 milligrams for the French fries. And if you want to knock it all out in one setting, go to Cracker Barrel, get the Southern Fried Chicken, 4,730 4, milligrams of sodium without the sides. So it's doable. Um, once you have confirmed uh, your case, then you want to try to classify. And, and basically we're gonna look with the adrenal CT scan to look to see, do we find a mass? So what we often see is either you're gonna have a, a mass, which is gonna be aldosterone producing adenoma or carcinoma on the gland, or sometimes what we call it, see is idiopathic hyperaldosteronism or bilateral hyperplasia. Um, in many cases, um, we do need to proceed with something called adrenal venous sampling. And the thought is, as we age, we get more incidental findings in the adrenal glands, and they may not be the source of your aldosterone. So anyone over 35 is often recommended to go ahead and proceed with this testing. Um, and definitely anyone with bilateral findings that you may want to be considering a surgical intervention for to determine if one of those uh, glands is secreting and the other one isn't. Um, I would also note that anything greater than 1.5 centimeters often co-secretes more than one home hormone. So this will also somewhat be defined when you do the adrenal venous sampling. And that's usually done um, of radiology, though I would say not all centers are able to do that. Um, so really finding some of the, the bigger medical centers that are used to doing it is probably where you want to go to make sure you get accurate findings. So treatment for this is gonna be adrenalectomy if there's unilateral disease. Um, a lot of times these patients, especially if they're young, they haven't had hypertension for very long um, or they're not on a whole lot of agents and will be able to get off of most, if not all of their blood pressure agents. Um, of course, the more agents they're on and the longer they've had it, we've already seen remodeling of the heart and fibrosis of the vessels. So some of that's irreversible and hypertension will remain. Um, Post-operatively, you do need to watch for hyperkalemia. The contralateral adrenal gland is not producing aldosterone. It hasn't woken up yet. So this can cause the potassium to rise. And additionally, with the hyperaldosterone, you have increased renal filtration. So when you pull that back, you can sometimes unmask some chronic kidney disease. And then if they have bilateral disease, we wanna proceed with medical treatment. And the uh, agent of choice is usually spironolactone. And this is because it has the greatest affinity out of the agents available for the mineral corticoid receptor. Um, doses sometimes exceed two, 200 to 300 milligrams a day required to block and treat this appropriately. Um, one thing um, to keep in mind that can be limiting is that uh, spironolactone is also uh, works on the androgen and the progesterone. Uh, receptors. So this can cause some symptoms such as gynecomastia and uh, low testosterone type symptoms, especially in male patients, in which case those patients can be uh, changed over to a plerinone. However, a plerinone isn't quite as strong as spironolactone, which is why it's not used first line. So next we'll move on to the middle layer of the cortex um, and talk a little bit about Cushing's.
Um, so Cushing syndrome is a very broad term and it can have a lot of different meanings, um, but basically it's, it's, it's excess exposure to glucocorticoids. The most common sign we see of this is basically iatrogenic. Someone's getting steroids for something, whether it's high potency dermatological creams, you know, steroid injections in joints, um, someone with a rheumatologic disease on a high dose prednisone. Um, this is what we most commonly see Cushing's actually caused by. Now, next is Cushing's disease, and this is really uh, more of a pituitary issue where you have ACTH production that triggers the adrenal glands, and it's more of a pituitary issue than an actual adrenal issue itself. And then the more specific Cushing syndrome that has to do with the adrenal gland is basically usually a mass in there that has caused overproduction. Now, clinically, these patients are going to present with weight gain, especially centrally located. You're going to see a very rounding and fullness of the faces, face. Um, you can get a uh, fat pad uh, in the back as well as collection of fat above the clavicles. These patients often have very easy bruising, very thin skin. Their wound healing tends to be poor. Um, and, and very, very obvious uh, for this, and, and probably one of the more specific findings I find for this is very wide, bright purple striae. I'm not talking about flesh colored or light pink that we sometimes see on people who have gained a lot of weight or been pregnant, but these are bright purple. And that's probably one of the more specific findings that I have found clinically in practice. They can also have hirsutism, uh, acne, and be more prone to skin fungal infections. Um, they will have some proximal muscle weakness, and then there's a lot of emotional cognitive changes. So depression is very common among this population. Um, and then there's comorbid uh, issues associated. So hypertension, diabetes, osteoporosis, and occasionally you can see some gonadal dysfunction. So next you move on to what are my lab testing um, to try to detect this. So there's multiple different tests to choose from. Some of it will depend on you know, what the patient prefers, what's easiest um, for you to, to get them to do. Um, but really uh, first test is a 24 hour collection of urine for urine free cortisol. Um, <clears throat> And so it's just making sure that they do the full collection um, and that they're not on any steroids when they're doing it to make sure we get accurate results that are, are very important. Uh, the next is you can get midnight salivary cortisol samples. Um, usually you wanna get two to three samples when you do this. And I usually have them test on a few consecutive nights to uh, better get a chance of really catching a high cortisol. Normally at midnight, your cortisol should be low. The other option is a one milligram overnight dexamethasone suppression test. So basically the patient's gonna take a dexamethasone between 11 p.m. and midnight and get their lab tested around eight o'clock in the morning. And what we wanna see is a nice low cortisol level in relation to taking that medication. And then the other option is you could get diurnal serum cortisol. So basically our cortisol should be high in the morning, low in the evening. So if you're testing in the morning and the evening and the levels are about the same, that is concerning for Cushing is because we lose that normal circadian movement uh, of cortisol in this condition. So depending on how suspicious you are, you may just get one test or all four, um, but oftentimes we do need at least two positive to kind of confirm the diagnosis. Um, and, and just of note, anyone who's taking a cortisone or cortisol containing agent, this will cause your lab testing to come high, whereas a lot of the other synthetic steroids will actually suppress your cortisol and cause you to be low, okay? So you start with your case detection test. If it's completely normal, yeah, they're not likely to have Cushing's, uh, but if you still suspect it, you wanna reevaluate them. And you can do that in three to six months or a year. It, it just depends again on how, how concerned you are. Um, if it's borderline testing, same thing, retest them if you're still concerned. Now, if a patient has a markedly abnormal test, and this is usually some test that's two to three times the upper limit of normal, then you wanna pursue your subtype testing to kind of classify and move on that diagnosis. So basically the way you do that is usually with an ACTH. Um, if you get a kind of mid-normal or increased level, then we're looking more at pituitary disease and scanning your pituitary to look for a mass is the way to go. Um, but in regards to the adrenal, you're gonna normally see an undetectable ACTH. So you get your CT scan, um, you're gonna look at it and then you're gonna go, hopefully you'll either see a, a unilateral mass, which is uh, either gonna be an adenoma or carcinoma. 
or sometimes you can see bilateral masses. So we got bilateral cortisol secreting adenomas are a possibility, or there are uh, some other syndromes that also cause bilateral masses that ex cause excess uh, cortisol secretion. So keep in mind, sometimes it's normal to have high cortisol. Um, so really looking at your patient, it's just figuring out what's going on. So things that can cause high cortisol that are completely normal are definitely pregnancy, someone who's severely obese, um, someone under severe psychologic stress, uh, poorly controlled diabetes, chronic alcoholism, and then physical stress. So being hospitalized um, is, is always a, a poor time to necessarily screen for this unless it's really going to make a, a difference that would in what you're doing. I wouldn't go looking for it at that point. Obstructive sleep apnea can also cause high cortisol levels. Now, if you get someone who's for whatever reason had testing, but they don't share clinical features, then you have to kind of look at what else may be going on. So those are going to be patients who definitely have malnutrition uh, and chronically exercise very intensely, have a high cortisol binding globulin, or from time to time, you may find one, someone with glucocorticoid resistance. Okay. So treatment-wise, um, unilateral ad, uh, adrenalectomy will cure uh, adenoma. Um, these uh, patients, uh, you know, quickly after surgery, the cortisol levels go down. The other adrenal gland does have to wake up. So a lot of times we do have to put them on steroids for short time uh, and taper them over the month, few months pro, uh, 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 as they clinically improve and recover. The other thing to keep in mind, these patients are at high risk for blood clots. Um, so thromboprophylaxis is also needed in all of these patients. Um, and then if the patient is non-surgical, uh, we don't forget about them, but we do want to treat them medically. Um, so typically we'll go with a steroidogenesis inhibitor. So block production of the cortisol at the adrenal gland. Ketoconazole is probably the most commonly used agent. Um, if they're in the, the hospital and decompensating, Accommodate might be a good option to choose. Um, and then you also have meteropone and midotane, which, which will also accomplish this. Now, if you're not going to go with one of those agents, you also have a glucocorticoid receptor antagonist, which is mifepristone, um, a little bit harder to get nowadays with all the uh, anti-abortion stuff going on in the United States, um, I would say. So now we're going to move to actually the innermost layer um, of, of the adrenal, um, the medulla, and talk a little bit about pheochromocytoma. So basically, this is a catecholamine secreting tumor. It's usually in the adrenal gland. When we find them outside of the adrenal gland, we actually call them paragangliomas. Um, and, and there's usually a slightly different uh, presentation as far as hormonal secretion and, and episodic spells um, with those particular uh, patients. So this is frequently sought and rarely found, sometimes called the, um, the holy grail of endocrinology. Um, but when it's correctly diagnosed and properly treats, it's very much curable. But if you don't diagnose it or you don't treat it properly, it can definitely be fatal. Okay. So low prevalence, luckily, um, 0.01 to 0.1% of the population occurs equally in men and women. And then primarily is going to occur in a peak in the third to fifth decades when it comes to light. Symptoms are not present in most patients nowadays, um, and actually less than 50% of patients have any symptoms. But when they have symptoms, again, they're usually proxismal, um, may last five minutes to an hour um, with those symptoms. So what are those symptoms? Um, Hyperhydronergic spells, palpitations, sweating, headache, um, shakiness. Um, you should also suspect this condition in anyone who has resistant hypertension. Um, if they have a familial syndrome that predisposes them, so MEN2, neurofibromatosis, von Hippel-Landau, those patients should be screened periodically. Um, if there's a family history of pheochromocytoma, um, any incidentally discovered adrenal mass, um, and then if someone has hypertension and some sort of atypical presentation of diabetes, you know, doesn't fit, fit the particular picture or, 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 or phenotype that often goes with diabetes. Um, if anyone who has pressor response to anesthesia or surgery, those, that's, that's a high cue. Um, if someone has hypertension at a very young age, uh, any idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy for any of my cardiologists out there, remember that. Um, and then if they have a history of a GI stromal tumor or pulmonary chondromas, there's, there's a, a high uh, co-occurrence with that. So testing for this, we want to look at 
fractionated catecholamines and metanephrines, and this is generally done with a 24-hour urine collection. Um, now, most of your commercial labs like LabCorp and Quest are already doing this, but you want to make sure your lab is doing it by high-performance liquid chromatography or tandem mass spec. If you get a lab that's running on the old radioimmunal assays, there can be a lot of interferences with other substances, and so then you may get kind of uh, skewed results. Um, and while it's preferred that patients not be on any medications, um, definitely we, we, we can continue most of them, especially the blood pressure. You want to make sure the blood pressure is well controlled because the blood pressure elevating itself can cause these levels to rise anyways. Um, probably the most common agent that interferes is a tricyclic antidepressant, um, and, and that's more with the 24-hour urine test, and there is a serum test I'll talk about in a second. Um, so, uh, in addition to that, other uh, affecting agents are SSRIs and MAOI inhibitors and then phenoxybenzamine. So, if someone's on one of those agents and it's possible to get them off, they should be tapered and stopped for a couple weeks before you go ahead and test them. And then, um, again, uh, in certain situations, uh, catecholamines do go up. So, illness, stroke, hospitalization, those are times when it could be normal to find an elevated level. So. Um, a few tips. Um, we never want to suppress or provoke someone with a suspected PO. You just do the lab testing. Um, in a patient with spells, the degree of increase in the catecholamines and metanephrines should be markedly abnormal. We're talking three to four times the upper limit of normal. If they're having spells and we don't see that, then the spells are not due to that. Um, and then the other thing to remember is just because the patient's on a beta blocker um, and they're not having any problems, it does not mean that they cannot have a FIO. They've just gotten very lucky so far. Um, and then if you do do uh, the plasma metanephrines, there's a 15% false positive rate. Some of the reason why some people are doing plasma metanephrines as opposed to the 24-hour urine collection is because it's a lot easier to get a patient to do a lab draw than a 24-hour urine collection. So I know in my clinical practice, a lot of times I do start with that because we're getting labs for other reasons. And I just let them know, hey, if it's positive, we may have to do your 24-hour urine collection. But if it's negative, it's actually pretty reassuring that they don't have it. All right. So once we kind of confirm, we're going to look at our imaging. Again, with a CT scan, that's most commonly how we look at the adrenal gland. Um, and with VOs, we're often going to see a large mass greater than four centimeters. It usually has irregular margins, is very inhomogeneous, and very dense and vascular. Um, and then we also look at uh, the, uh, the picture of it in, in something called Hounsfield units. Hounsfield units, basically, if you don't know what this is, compares how something is in comparison to the liver density-wise. So anything with high Hounsfield units um, is, is, is considered more dense. So we're going to have high-density lesions. So generally, these are going to be greater than 20 um, when measured. And if you happen to have a study with contrast, you're going to see very low washout at 10 minutes. So once we find our imaging, then the treatment is always going to be surgery, but these patients do need to be medically prepared. So we first want to start with alpha blockade. Um, historically, phenoxybenzamine is a non-reversible alpha, alpha blocker, and that's what's been used. Due to cost um, and, and inability to get it in some places, sometimes we're using the more common alpha blockers, doxazosin, parazosin. Those do no, normally need to be dosed two to three times a day. Um, the patients are generally very volume contracted, so following a high sodium diet and, and, and being very liberal with fluids is important. Yeah. The other thing is with their alpha blockade, we're trying to make them almost orthostatic to block off enough receptors and not have a response from those high catecholamines and metanephrines. Um, now, once the patient's been adequately alpha blocked, then you want to proceed on with your beta blockade, and any beta blocker can generally be used. And honestly, that's usually started just a few days before surgery, okay? Now, if for some reason someone can't do the alpha and beta blockade, then there are other regimens with calcium channel blockers um, that can be used too. Now, once these are surgically removed, they're generally cured. We have no e issues. However, annual biochemical screening is still recommended. Um, occasionally, someone can present with another mass in the other adrenal or recurrence if perhaps some of the original adrenal was left behind. Um, so in that case, you want to do your 24-hour urine collection every year. Um, I've actually had patients come to me who've had these had been removed, lost insurance or whatever for a few years, and it's recurred. And by the time we get to them, 
it's spread and metastases. Those are always, unfortunately, the patients that lose insurance, the ones that really uh, end up having the recurrence, it seems like. So moving on, and this is what most commonly an internist will probably see is, is more of an incident aloma. And this is where you'll get into a lot of, of, of testing and screening for these things. So an incident aloma is basically defined as a lesion that's greater than a centimeter, um, unexpectedly discovered during radiologic exam. So the prevalence um, is about three to 4% of patients undergoing abdominal imaging, imaging. And we're gonna see this peak in about the sixth to seventh decade of life. Generally, as you get older in age, we tend to see more and more incidental findings on things that may or may not be anything. So the importance of screening is um, that up to 30% can harbor mild autonomous cortisol excess or subclinical Cushing's. Now, one thing I will say about that, that high number quoted has uh, probably the using testing using the most the most generous tests with false positives. And if you get into more specific testing, looking at that, you probably see a rate that's more around 10%. Um, if you're a little bit more scrutinizing over your criteria you use for that cutoff. So when we look at the incidentaloma, um, a lot, if we have the images, great. If not, we're relying on radiology to tell us what is this. So in benign lesions, we're generally going to have smaller lesions, less than four centimeters, um, often unilateral. Um, they're going to have very distinct margins and be round, homogeneous. The Hounsfield units are going to be very low. And if you have a contrast study, we're gonna see rapid washout. In the event you had an MRI that picked this up, we're gonna see something that's ISO intense on T1 and T2 weighted images. <clears throat> so, <coughs> excuse me, in the mass here, uh, we have about a three centimeter um, uh, mass on the right adrenal and it's Hounsfield units is probably about five. And this is basically just a very lipid rich uh, adrenal mass. So very benign type picture of what we might see. So then on the flip side, we're looking at things is it malignant. And when it's malignant, then we have to start thinking, is this a primary malignancy or a metastatic concern? So uh, when we see malignant type pictures, it's often gonna be a very large mass, greater than four centimeters, have irregular borders, be inhomogeneous, lots of times see calcifications. The Hounsfield units are gonna be higher, at least 10, and the washout's gonna be low if you have a contrasted study. In the event you got an MRI, hypo-intense on T1 and a high to inter intermediate T2 signal. And if we see unilateral, we're more concerned with adrenal cortical carcinoma. And when you see bilateral, that's more concerning for metastases. So in this particular picture, you got two arrows pointing to each of the adrenal glands, and this is metastatic disease. Um, so, all right. <clears throat> so we've established what our characteristics look like of our, our, our gland. And so now we need to look at the function of the gland. And so a lot of this is very similar to the testing we talked about for the, the aldosteronism and the, the, the Cushing's and everything, but it's kind of more pared down. Um, so basically we wanna look for autonomous cortisol secretion and that's done with your dexamethasone suppression test. But the other thing we get with it nowadays is a DHEAS level. And the benefit of getting a, a DHEAS level is that generally if the uh, adrenal gland is producing cortisol, your ACTH should be low. Um, so if you have a, a very high DHEAS level, then that means that your body's seeing ACTH and this is less likely to be secreting that. Um, so, so it's kind of a backup to that test because with that test, if the patient forgot to take the pill or they're a rapid metabolizer of that agent, then you could have a false positive screen. So again, making sure they both agree with each other. Um, for pheochromocytoma, again, we're gonna either get the plasma metanephrines because again, sometimes that's easier to do or the 24 hour urine collection. And then for primary hyperaldosteronism, again, checking the aldosterone, checking the lorenin, looking to see uh, what's your ratio and if they're very uh, high. And then if your initial uh, functional testing is negative, we do usually say, let's repeat the imaging after 12 months. We wanna make sure it's not growing. 
Uh, also, sometimes when you get imaging, maybe the radiologist didn't describe the adrenal gland so well because they were more worried about the bowel obstruction or whatever else they were looking at. And so sometimes more imaging characteristics can come out, um, especially if you're doing it specifically for the adrenal um, and really having them focus on what these different characteristics are. Um, and then the only other uh, biochemical testing you really have to do is usually they recommend screening for the cortisol again for the next four years. So generally after five years, with no change um, uh, in biochemical, no clinical changes in the patient, a lot of times we just kind of say, okay, this is not likely to change and you can kind of let it go. Um, so with an incidental lona, who, who should get their adrenal taken out? Well, definitely if it's got a pheochromocytoma, and I will tell you nowadays, pheochromocytomas are found more um, in what we call the pre-biochemical stage where we have very suspicious looking um, imaging um, may not test positive, but when you take it out and they send it off for path, there it is, okay? So that's why, again, it's very important to look at the imaging characteristics, not just the lab tests to see what it is. And that's why also the pheochromocytoma with the patients not always presenting with symptoms because again, those patients didn't have symptoms. It was just like, oh, here's a mass, let's take it out. Oh, look what you had, okay? Definitely, if you have adrenal cortical cancer or anything that's suspicious for it. So again, going back to imaging characteristics, if you have an aldosterone producing adenoma, um, and then if you have subclinical Cushing's in a young patient. And that is because in a young patient, with the thought that this may progress slowly over time, uh, all the metabolic issues that come from the high cortisol exposure over the years uh, would, would be something to look into. Again, subclinical means the patient's not having symptoms. So that's why in an older patient that maybe, you know, doesn't have a long life expectancy, you may not want to mess with them. But if you have a 25 year old um, who has this, they've hopefully got a lot of life to live and this is all about improving their quality of life long term. Now any mass with a suspicious imaging phenotype that's large, so greater than four centimeters. Um, and then adrenal myolipomas. Now generally these are very benign masses and you leave them alone. And usually your, your radiologist will be able to tell and call out if that's what this looks like um, when you do your imaging. But if it's already greater than six centimeters, we usually have it removed because of the concern of compression upon the surrounding structures, okay? All right, now we're gonna switch modes and kind of talk about a little bit of the low adrenal estates. Um, so this is looking at adrenal insufficiency. So what is it? Um, it's basically a physiologic state characterized by fail of the adrenal cortex to produce cortisol and aldosterone, which is in the case of primary or just cortisol if we're talking about secondary adrenal insufficiency. Um, these are often very hard to recognize. Um, signs and symptoms really depend on how quickly uh, did they lose adrenal function, the extent of the adrenal function that's still there, um, whether it's primary and mineral corticoid production is lost or if it's secondary and that's preserved and the, the degree of stress the patient is under. Um, the onset is often very gradual. A patient may be having vague symptoms for years when you look back after the fact. Um, and so it typically may go undetected until an illness or other stress precipitates a crisis. So when we look at symptoms of primary adrenal insufficiency, um, there's a whole host of symptoms, most commonly weakness, anorexia, GI upset, weight loss. Um, with primary, you also have hyperpigmentation, low blood pressure, and then electrolyte disturbances. Um, now, when we move on to secondary, we lose some of those. And again, it's because of your preserved mineral corticoid um, uh, production. So we lose a lot of the electrolyte findings and the hypotension. Um, and then uh, the hyperpigmentation issue has to do more with ACTH, chronic ACTH exposure um, that you wouldn't have with secondary, okay? So you won't see that in secondary. So when we're talking about primary, the most common cause is autoimmune, which is also known as Addison's disease. The second most common cause is congenital adrenal hyperplasia. And the most common uh, mutation for that is the 21 hydroxylase deficiency. Um, and then when we move on to secondary cases, um, the most common cause for secondary adrenal insufficiency is a glucocorticoid induced suppression of the hypothalamic pituitary axis, uh, adrenal axis. 
Uh, basically, anyone who's on about five milligrams of pregnisone or equivalent um, for greater than four weeks is going to be a possibility for them. Now, anyone who has any kind of hypothalamus or pituitary mass is going to be at risk, and then anyone who's had pituitary surgery or radiation to the CNS. Now, I will say also when it comes to other causes, infection, autoimmune of either the pituitary or the adrenal gland or infiltrates in those glands can cause it. Um, another thing to keep in mind, checkpoint inhibitors, which they're using more and more in oncology can cause either a primary or a secondary adrenal insufficiency. And in a lot of those cases, we are not seeing that that is reversible if those agents are stopped down the road. So how do we diagnose it? Um, a lot of times it comes to attention based off of someone getting a morning cortisol. Um, generally, um, if the cortisol level is at least 18, we go, okay, your adrenal function is, is probably normal. Um, if it's really low, like less than three, then it's probably more likely to be adrenal insufficiency. Uh, we always have to throw caution to any patient that has cortisol binding globulin uh, or, or albumin abnormalities, because what we're looking at is a total cortisol, which of course can be affected by that. So um, falsely low levels could be patients with cirrhosis or nephrotic syndrome, and definitely falsely high levels could be those on oral estrogens, such as those on birth control or hormone replacement. So diagnosis um, it, more definitively is usually proceeding next step to the cosentropin stimulation test. Um, so with this, you get your baseline cortisol. Um, you can really do this at any time of the day, but a lot of times we try to do it at eight o'clock again to kind of try to see those peak levels. Um, and then they're inject injected with cosentropin 250 microgram. Cosentropin is basically almost like an artificial ACTH to the adrenal glands. Um, and then we're gonna measure your cortisol at 30 and 60 minutes to make sure it rises appropriately. Now there are all kinds of different cutoffs for where it should be, depending upon how it's injected and stuff. Um, but really, if your level goes up to 18, then the thought is you're probably okay. Um, but if your level does not come up that high, it's not okay. Um, and then that would be concerning for adrenal insufficiency. Now, again, watch for your albumin or cortisol binding globulin abnormalities. In some of those patients, you may actually have to look for double or tripling um, of the baseline to stimulated cortisol levels to see that we had adequate rise. So with this test, it's about 95% sensitive for a primary adrenal insufficiency case, but it's not very good for secondary. So those ones are always a little bit more difficult um, to define uh, what's going on there. Um, and, and really just kind of sometimes clinically you have to follow them and see them and, and, and know that history to, to determine that. So additional testing that can be helpful, definitely an ACTH level. If it's very high, that's gonna be consistent with primary adrenal insufficiency. And in those patients with primary, you also wanna look at the renin and aldosterone because what you should see is a high renin and low aldosterone. Um, you may wanna look at a 21 hydroxylase antibody to look for that autoimmune, um, uh, which is the most common cause. Um, and then a lot of times we'll get a CT of the adrenal glands to look and make sure there's no mass or other things and structurally that they're normal. Um, if you happen to be dealing with children, always keep in the back of your mind, 17 hydroxyprogesterone to screen for congenital adrenal hyperplasia or very long chain fatty acids in, 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 in young boys con for concerns of adrenal leukodystrophy. Um, in patients with secondary, um, basically, because most commonly this is due to an issue with the pituitary signaling, we want to look at the rest of the pituitary axes, okay, and then imaging of the pituitary to make sure everything also structurally looks good there. So if we talk about treatment, uh, no lectures complete without a little bit of history. So 1930s Mayo Clinic had a set of researchers that were looking at adrenal extracts. Um, they named these extracts in alphabetical order and compound E is the one that ended up being associated with cortisol. And uh, about 20 years later in the 1950s, these men actually went on to win the Nobel prize for their work in that area. So treatment-wise, uh, for primary, we're looking at glucocorticoid and mineral corticoid replacement. And most commonly, we're going to use hydrocortisone and fludrocortisone. Um, now, there's some controversy over DHEA supplementation in females. And again, this goes back to in the normal adrenal gland, 
there's not a lot of androgen production. Um, so uh, the most of the time this is not recommended. If I have a patient that brings it up or something, then sometimes we try it, um, but otherwise we don't really focus on that. So don't get caught up in that detail. Um, <clears throat> now for secondary adrenal insufficiency, we're only looking at glucocorticoid replacement. So when we dose, um, we are generally gonna use hydrocortisone and you're gonna look at dosing it somewhere between eight and five milligrams per body surface area squared. So that usually equates somewhere from 15 to 30 milligrams a day. And you do that in divided doses, either two or three doses with your highest dose in the morning and the lower doses later in the day, again, mimicking what the body would normally do. Um, alternatively, if they can't do hydrocortisone, sometimes prednisone is given either once or twice a day or dexamethasone, uh, which only needs to be dosed once a day. Your goal of therapy is really the lowest dose that they need. You're going to titrate based off the symptoms. You're not going to try to follow the ACTH or anything and try to normalize that. If you do that, you will grossly overtreat these patients. And then uh, for mineral corticoids, um, you're going to do uh, 0.05 to 0.2 milligrams of fluidocortisone, and you're going to titrate this uh, based off their renin. So basically, uh, if their renin is very low, that means that you have them on too much. If it's quite high, you don't have them on that enough. So really kind of upper end of the normal range is where you want them to live. So um, stress dosing is an important thing that we always have to go over in patients with adrenal insufficiency. Um, so when they're ill, have a fever, double or tripling their glucocorticoids is important. And most of these patients that should have at home some sort of IM or sub-Q injection for steroid replacement in the event they can't take anything by mouth. Um, basically, stress dosing is also going to be needed any time the adrenals would make extra uh, cortisol. So strenuous exercise, uh, finals in college, undergoing surgery or anesthesia, um, any severe emotional distress. Um, and, and then the patient, hopefully over time, will learn their symptoms of when their cortisol is starting to get low so they know when to stress dose. Um, keep in mind with hot weather and excess sweating, we may have to up the fluid cortisone dose a little bit um, to help with fluid retention and keep them from losing so much sodium. And then uh, patients just constantly need uh, reminders about stress dosing. So just reminding, hey, have you done this? Have you been sick? Did you double? Um, do you have a surgery coming up? Um, so moving on to adrenal crisis, <laughs> uh, basically when things don't go right. Um, so when they did studies in patients on chronic replacement therapy for adrenal insufficiency, they found that about 8% of patients have an adrenal crisis per year. And the mortality rate for this is, is, is about 0.5 per 100 patient years. Um, so we want to prevent this if possible. Um, so basically in patients with a history of adrenal insufficiency, the most common cause was an infection. Other causes were maybe getting hospitalized with a heart attack, having a surgery, a car wreck, something like that. Um, another cause is forgetting their steroids. Um, so always good to remind the patients to not wait until that last day to refill because you know the ice storm may come and then I can't get to the pharmacy for three more days. And, and that would be a problem. And then sometimes they can be on medications that interfere with either their absorption or metabolism of the steroids. Now in patients without adrenal insufficiency, um, we usually are gonna see some sort of sudden change with either the adrenal or the pituitary gland. Uh, so sudden thrombosis or infarction, hemorrhage into the gland, an apoplexy of the pituitary um, is something that causes an acute and sudden change. Um, so uh, when it comes to a crisis presentation, shock is gonna be your most common symptoms. They can also have some of the nonspecific things like the weight loss and nausea, um, but you're rarely ever gonna see hypoglycemia in, in, in this particular case. And, and, and the main thing to remember about crisis is time of, of the essence. So a lot of times you won't have time to do diagnostic testing, testing so treat um, rather than not treat um, if need be. So now we move on to who needs empiric glucocorticoids. Um, and this gets into a lot of controversy and a, a, a lot of uh, very non-scientific non uh, determinants, no, no real good data. So basically there's no consensus on cortisol cutoffs 
for patients with adrenal insufficiency and critical illness. And it's a very complex issue. And it has to do with the fact that when they're critically ill, they should have higher uh, cortisol levels, um, but they can also have uh, concurrent illnesses making things like cortisol binding globulin be off, uh, which would make your total cortisol appear lower. So the answer to this is really we need free cortisol levels to help with some of this, but it's just not practical. Um, getting a free cortisol level on lab takes weeks, and really there's, there's no standardization or cutoff to know where those levels should actually be. So people have gone through and, and done uh, some kind of flow charts and studies and thoughts about how you should triage and who you should treat. Um, so if you can't quite see that chart, the link to where that came from is at the bottom of the slide. But basically they say, first off, let's just kind of figure out is the patient hemodynamically stable or unstable? If they're unstable, they're in septic shock, then yes, go ahead and give them steroids. If they're more hemodynamically stable or if they're not in septic shock, then you got time to kind of evaluate the cortisol and determine where it is. And if the level's a little bit on the lower side, then this is a patient that either you want to give or maybe even consider go ahead and proceeding with a cosentropin stimulation test. So, all right. So basically critically ill patients with septic shock are considered different than typical adrenal insufficiency um, uh, patients. Uh, in these patients with hypotension that's resistant to vasopressors, fluid therapy, it's always gold standard to use uh, glucocorticoids. Um, and, and it's interesting because randomized controlled trials haven't actually shown any mortality benefits. Um, so the thought is with these that the glucocorticoids actually uh, improve something beyond what has to do with the adrenal glands. Um, so with that, since it's not really related to the adrenals, it has to do something with the illness itself. There's actually no consensus on tapering, stopping, and even how long in some cases they should be treated. But in most cases, they give them a trial of a few days and then see how it goes. Um, so what I would say to all my people who may be in the ICU treating a lot of times, again, if there's a high suspicion treat, we can always sort out the cause and stuff after the fact. But if the patient's not around to treat anymore, then there's nothing to sort out. So that's kind of the primary concern. So um, that brings us to the end. <laughs> Any questions? Floor is open, hands up. Online questions? Yeah, there are a lot of online questions. Uh-oh. And then I was just gonna ask, are you seeing any patients presenting with adrenal insufficiency because they have prostate cancer and on blockade therapy? You know, we support them with five milligrams of prednisone mm -hmm. a day, okay. but most of it's done by the urologist. And I, I'm not seeing very many people take stress doses or be aware that they need to tell somebody, you know, if we see a medical oncology, we usually further educate them. But I'm just I'm yeah. surprised that we don't see more of that now. Yeah, no, I personally have not seen that, um, but that would definitely be, yeah, someone that needs to be educated that, you know, your adrenals may be suppressed and you need to stress dose if you get into trouble. So, so yeah. What, what? All right, Damon, go ahead. So, well, I have one question. But have you seen the unicorn? Which unicorn? The Theo? Theo? Yes. Oh, yes. I've got quite a few. Yeah, I'm still looking for one. <laughs> um, so uh, first question um, is uh, from Dr. Munahale, who's one of our nephrologists. Uh, so I wanted to press it because it's kind of long. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'm glad you mentioned in primary hyperthyroidism that the ratio cut may even be lower. My colleagues and I have found this often in our practice. And after we start these patients on aldactone, their blood pressures significantly improve. Do you still diagnose these patients with hyperaldosteronism or proceed with any secondary testing? Um, I, I think in that particular case, if you were concerned, uh, looking at the adrenals imaging wise to see if there's something there is good, but what they're doing more research wise, they're finding a lot more genetic involvement with certain mutations. 
Um, they're also finding what they call micro nodules in there, um, which you may not see on imaging. So I think, yeah, you could theoretically call them that, but officially for all the guidelines of what, what the criteria meets, I don't know that they, they'd meet that. Um, so, so yeah, it's kind of complex there. Why are the striae so purple in people with Cushing's disease? Is it due to the cortisol excess? What causes that purple stuff? Yeah, I, I think it has to do with cortisol um, because I, I've seen a few patients present with that who are on high dose steroids with other things. Um, so it, it has something to do with the way that, that they trigger that. If you want to give somebody a dose pack, if you want to give somebody a dose pack, for, let's say, uh, poison ivy or do a knee injection with 80 milligrams of methylprednisolone or an epidural steroid injection, how long would you expect the adrenals to be suppressed? So that is always the question of uh, <laughs> the question. Someone actually plugged it into group, that group, uh, the chat group thing, the, the automated thing and got this crazy answer that's basically like, it could be any amount of time. Uh, most of the time we say, you know, probably a good six to eight weeks at least, but in some patients longer, depending upon how their body totally clears all that out. But if you're talking about a medrol dose pack and a steroid, yeah, that, that's two hits of, of things. So it could take quite a while. Uh, I think also some of it depends on how, how localized it is in the joint. Uh, if it takes longer to dissipate out, then yeah, it, it can take longer to clear that from the system. There's, there's more online, Stephen, if nobody else in the audience here I has I think Dr. Any. Hunt has a question. We'll alternate, go Baker. Uh, because uh, the Neronone is a non-steroidal MRA, would it theoretically be more or less likely to be a treatment option for primary hyperaldosteronism? I mean, it might be. Um, theoretically, it should work. I'm not aware of any studies being done and it's definitely uh, not on the FDA label. But yeah, it, it should in theory. Jeff? So number one, do you do that many adrenal biopsies in the first place? And if so, who is doing those for you? I wouldn't typically biopsy. I don't think I've, I've ever really done a, an adrenal biopsy. Uh, now, adrenal venous sampling, yes, um, but not a biopsy. If something's suspicious enough that I think I need a biopsy, just take it out. I bring this up is with endoscopic ultrasound, that ad left adrenal gland is right by the stomach. Mm -hmm. And I see a lot of adrenal adenomas. At mm -hmm. least they, they look like adenomas to me, but, you know, uh, the, the right adrenal is harder to stick because it's more under the liver and it's further away from the stomach. But um, if you ever need tissue, Scott and I can get that for you, okay, just so sure. you know. And I'll make sure that I've ruled out that it's not a FIO first. Yeah, yeah anesthesia really is freaks out when I say I want to poke say it. and file for us. <laughs> no more cheap plugs, Jeff. In the patients that have metastatic carcinoma, we frequently prove their metastatic by biopsying the adrenal. So uh, if there's a known primary malignancy, then obviously it's, it's very appropriate. I think you do. Okay. So um, next one is, I often find plasma metanephrines come back positive by only 0 0.1 or 0 0.2 of the upper limit. Should I get a 24 hour urine on these patients or is it just a false positive? Uh, yeah, if it's, if it's very mild, mild elevation, especially if the patient has known hypertension, there's actually a different reference range in hypertensive patients that's a little bit higher than most standard lab reference ranges. So unless you're sending your labs off to Mayo, who automatically puts that in, uh, then chances are that mild elevation is, is unlikely to be anything significant. But definitely if the patient's having spells or something, it may not be a bad idea to go ahead and proceed with that 24-hour urine collection just for greater accuracy and totally ruling out that that's the case. Um, so uh, next one is uh, prefaced with the statement, not quite an adrenal gland question, but as you mentioned, paraganglioma. Mm -hmm. I have a patient where I diagnosed a paraganglioma slash VO by lab and imaging sent to a local endocrine, endocrine surgeon and nephro, local endo wanted surgery, but sent to a second endo 
who said watch and wait, retest again. Is there ever a reason to avoid or delay surgery or watch and wait for confirmed non-adrenal paraaortic paraganglioma in an otherwise healthy patient? I have to call out the author of that, Ryan Norman. I don't know who that is, but okay. <laughs> Ryan, <laughs> Ryan Morgan. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I don't know why you would wait on something like that. Um, again, when you catch, even, even for paragangliomas, you, you catch them early. I don't know that I'd watch and wait for things to get worse um, and, and potentially spread to other areas. Um, a lot of times when they take out paragangliomas, there's a lot of genetic things. And, and so genetically, they can actually even tell you if you're likely to recur or not, depending upon the mutation found. So, so yeah, maybe go to endo number three um, <laughs> and, and, and get a general consensus. Last one. Um, in the hospitalized elderly patient who has an albumin less than 3.5 grams, should the cosentropin dose be higher than 250 micrograms? No, that's already a super, super uh, physiologic dose. So there's no reason to dose even higher. And honestly, albumin of 3.5 is not that, that low. <laughs> so I have us at officially 1150. Okay. So I want to make sure that we kind of keep moving along and be ready for everything else. So I thank you, Dr. St. John. Thank you all.